Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's AP Now webinar. I'm Mary Schaefer, AP Now's founder, and we're here today to talk about fraud. Uh, we're going to talk about newer frauds, how to spot, and how to spot them when targeted. We have a special section um, included in this session that will address uh, some of the newer things that happened during COVID. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. Everyone is in listen-only mode. You can download a copy of the slide deck from the handout section of your console on the right or email publisher at ap-now.com and we'll send them to you after the event. If you don't see your console, look for a little orange arrow in the top right-hand corner of your computer and click on it and your console will pop out. Our program will consist of the formal presentation with time for questions from the audience at the end. If a question occurs to you as we go along, please enter it in the box marked question hit ca and hit carriage return. We'll take them at the end. As we go along, we'll occasionally be asking you the audience questions to monitor participation for CPE certificates since they are granted based on participation. When this occurs, Please enter the response you think best in the box marked question, um, and I will report on it in the aggregate. No one will be able to see your answers. So, for example, in question one, if your answer was no, your answer would be 1C. About an hour after the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to an evaluation form. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take a moment to fill this out. Um, if you would like a CPE Certificate of Attendance for NASBA continuing, continuing Professional Education Purposes, or any other purpose for that matter, that needs to be requested on the same form. To receive the, the certificate, the evaluation form should be completed within one week. And with that, let's turn our attention to our program for today. I can see some of you have already started uh, filling in the answers, so let's go to question one. Um, has your organization experienced an increase in attempted fraud attempts since March, such as phony wire transfer requests, phony change of bank account requests, or anything else? And we have a wide variety of answers, A, B, and C. Um, and I'm looking through this, um, and I would say um, slight, uh, slightly more A's and C's than B's. Um, and I will tell you from what I read in the press, the answer is if you see a lot more, um, you're not alone. Okay, just trying to get a handle on uh, where everybody is. So today's program will consist of some background information. Uh, then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about COVID-related um, stuff, if you will, uh, fraud-related, obviously, uh, frauds that went on, things that have happened. Uh, then we'll talk about specific uh, frauds and, and the targets, and then some prevention tactics that everybody can use. Now, when we talk today, the main uh, focus is going to be on frauds um, that impact your organization, but almost everything, um, with the exception of like the phony uh, uh, change of uh, bank account or turning phony wire transfer request frauds. Everything we talk about could apply to you personally just as easily as your company. So even though we're focused on the company, keep this in mind for some of, some of the things we say for your own personal life. Our goal today, by the way, is to get you to think and analyze so that when you are presented with a new fraud, one that you know I'm not able to tell you about today because I don't know about it, um, you'll be able to recognize it as a fraud and not fall for it. So if, I, if you go away with one thought uh, from today, one lesson, it's think before you act because you'll see as we go through this stuff that a number of these frauds, if the person had just stopped and thought about it for a minute, they'd realize, of course, this is a fraud. But of course, we're all overworked and uh, we don't always have the time to stop and think and analyze as much as we would like. Okay, so this one slide is my little attempt at humor um, and just a, a commentary on how much our worlds have changed. For last December, 
I said something to you about putting on a mask before you went into a building or into a store, rather, it would have a whole different meaning than um, today. And you'd probably look at me as though I had four heads with that piece of advice. All right, now on to the serious stuff. Fraud hurts in more ways than is initially obvious. We always think about the financial loss, the money that went out the door. But there are some other um, not so obvious hurts, if you will. And these are just as difficult, if not sometimes more difficult to deal with than the, the, the financial loss. All of these end up bringing additional uh, scrutiny. So when an organization falls for a fraud, uh, sometimes there is a reputational risk, uh, a reputational hurt, if you will. You know, people will look at that company and say, hmm, I don't know if I want to do business with them. Um, you know, look what they fell for. Is my data safe there? We're now all concerned about, with good reason, by the way, our data. There's, and there's an impact on our managers and on the, on, on the staffers. So the managers, for example, will, um, if the loss was more than a few dollars, um, generally somebody will have to go up to the board of directors and explain how did this happen? How did this happen on your watch? What kind of controls did you have in place? What went wrong? And of course, Hopefully that, that's none of you. You don't have to be the person up at the board of directors having that very uncomfortable conversation about how this happened, what was wrong with our internal controls. Of course, um, you know, this is one of those situations where the buck doesn't stop here. And when that manager finally gets back to the office, um, you know, the staff is going to have to answer some questions also. How did this happen? You know, what did we do wrong? Um, did we let did we let a control go that we shouldn't have? And um, what, some of the things that I've seen from talking to folks just like you, and maybe even some of you, is that when this happens, the the, the fallout is not pretty. Um, there have been a number of cases where uh, maybe the AP manager was demoted because this happened on their watch, even though they had nothing to do with it. And I know of a few cases where people were fired. Um, this typically happened because they didn't do a verification of change of bank account address um, that they were supposed to, that had been written into the procedures. Okay, and that of course was because they were overworked. But we're going to talk more about that um, in, in a little bit. Keep in mind that today's crooks uh, for the most part, are really smart. The ones that are involved in some of this ongoing um, electronic fraud are, are smart. They understand technology. They understand the banking. The English has gotten really good, um, and they know how to use this knowledge, and they do use this knowledge to their advantage. Of course, their advantage is your disadvantage. And they've gotten very creative, by the way, in looking for loopholes, finding loopholes. And then once they find that little weakness or that loophole, you know, uh, maneuvering it and, and taking advantage of it. So as we've seen with, with some of the newer frauds, um, I wish that, you know, I could sit here and tell you the, the new fraud that's going to come up and that's going to, you know, people are going to try and use to defraud you a week from now, a month from now. But I'm afraid that my mind doesn't work that way. and so. I'm left with you just trying to figure out what's coming um, next. Um, as you've probably noticed, these new frauds continually develop um, at ama an amazing speed, and they do require sometimes that you change some of your processes and your procedures. You need to do this on um, a very regular basis because it's the only way that you can uh, protect yourself and protect your uh, company. So you need to be continually alert. That's where we come in. We try, and as soon as we hear about a new fraud, we'll put it in our, our newsletter, but we'll also put it in um, our twice-a-week e-zine to try and alert you, hey, this is going on, because um, crooks, if they're successful, I guess just like anybody else, if something works uh, once, they'll try it again and again until it doesn't work. And keep in mind, crooks don't discriminate. They don't care if you're big or small. They don't care whether you have a few dollars or a lot of money. They prefer a lot of money, by the way but um, uh, don't ever be under the uh, impression that you're too small. And I have some stories about that in a little bit, but I don't want to sell it to 
I don't want to uh, repeat myself. So one thing to keep in mind when we talk about fraud prevention is it's a team effort. This is not like processing invoices where you can, you know, assign somebody the job or master vendor file. You can uh, uh, assign the job. This is one of the things where we all have to pitch in because as we've seen in the last few years, Crooks don't necessarily always go to the manager. They'll go to whoever um, they see, they perceive as the weak link. And you might be the weak link, by the way, simply because you don't have all the information. Not that there's anything inferior about you. Far from it. Okay? So, let's get started. Okay, some of the newer frauds. We have all we talk about the change of bank account fraud, uh, the phony wire transfer requests that came from uh, supposedly from the CFO or some other high-level executive, and uh, boss impersonation fraud, which is also what I call the gift card fraud. Um, and that involves uh, somebody getting an email or a text. Be aware that it can, it, there have been a number of cases where it's come as a text. And, you know, it starts off with, hi, how you doing? Um, do you have a few, if you have a few spare minutes, can you help me out? Something like that. And you respond, yes. And you think this, this email or text has come from your boss. Um, although there have been a few cases where it's come from in a smaller company like the president of the CEO of the company right before a Christmas party, for example. And, so, and it, it has some good reason. Can you go out and get um, $500 or $1,000 worth of gift cards? Um, I want to, we want to give them out as prizes for whatever or to say thank you. You know, something that seems legitimate. So the person goes out and buys the gift cards. And I have to tell you, I probably would have fallen for the first part of this of this uh, scam, so I can't point too many fingers. And then the second part of it is when the person gets back with the gift cards, and this is where you wish people had, you know, just stopped and thought for a minute. Um, another email comes in or another text, and it says, "Did you get the cards?" And you write back, "Yes." And they and the person says, "Can you scratch off the information on the back?" and either give me those numbers over the phone or scan it and send it to me. And of course, it's a crook who then turns that information into cash. They know how to um, cash the gift cards out with that information. So anyway, that's how that one works. Um, and you can see here that roughly half of um, our readership has um, been uh, f focused on, the, has been targeted with this type of crime of the different types, the boss impersonation for it a little bit more than some of the others. And unfortunately, almost a third fell for the um, change of bank account fraud, um, uh, low, lower numbers for the boss impersonation fraud, fraud and the phony wire transfer fraud. Uh, most of the time, if this happens and a company falls for it, it's only once. The exception to that is the boss impersonation fraud, and that is because that dollar amount is so low that companies don't do a really good job of making sure all their employees um, are educated about it. And I know of one case where uh, the... Um, company fell for it several times because what the crook was doing was going on LinkedIn, finding new employees at the company, and then targeting them. So then eventually that company had to make that education part of its new employee welcome um, experience. All right. So um, taking the, um, the statistics a little further, over three quarters had experienced at least one of those frauds. So I would expect, it's a little bit after this survey was completed, that by this point, most of you have been at least targeted. Maybe not fell for it, but targeted. And a number of people have fallen for it, unfortunately. Um, this is why, uh, this is where I'm going to begin my message of you have to educate everyone. Um, we asked who was targeted, and you can see there's no clear winner here, if you will. Um, everyone from the CEO and the CFO right down to your AP processes. So when I talk about educating everyone, um, I like to say sometimes you start with the CEO right down to the person who sweeps the floor. Um, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you get where I'm going with this. Everyone must be um, educated. And one of my readers once said that whenever they get uh, they learn of a new uh, fraud or I write of a new fraud, they make a copy of whatever it is and share it with everybody. Again, from the CEO right down to the uh, guy or the woman who, who sleeps the, sweeps the floor. Keep in mind, 
that while yes, crooks absolutely prefer money, um, they are looking for um, what they use in the legal term, anything of value. And anything of value can mean basically anything of value that they can turn into money eventually. And that might include data, and of course, obviously, merchandise that they can go ahead and sell. Okay, so don't be lulled um, as some were with that W-2 scam into just thinking it's about money. Um, so well, let's talk about data. Um, they are finding new ways to exploit data. The traditional uh, methodology, if you uh, will, was to simply um, sell credit card data. So the crooks, and that's why we had so many of these um, uh, uh, hacks, if you will, at either banks or um, uh, credit card issuers where they got a hold of the people's names and the credit card numbers, and they were able to ex you know, use that, either sell that data on the black web or use it um, for online shopping. But now they have new ways to exploit data. And again, remember that um, these, these guys are innovative and they're always looking for um, weak links. Um, in some of these frauds, and I'll have a story a little later on, they, were at, they will ask for a bank statement pretending to be the president of the company. You might say, well, well, what would they do with the bank statement? And they can do one of two things. If the bank statement also has the bank account number on it, they are now primed, if you, you will, for either a phony ACH debit um, or um, a phony wire transfer or even an ACH credit out of your account. Um, but also, if they're trying to do one of these rush wire transfer uh, scams along the same way, um, by having your bank statement, they'll know how much money you have and they'll know whether it's appropriate to ask you for $50,000 or $500,000 they'll be able to get an idea of what is the dollar amount of transactions that you normally do. So for example, if somebody went to um, IBM and asked for a wire transfer of $5,000, um, that would probably set off bells that something was off. Um, and likewise, if they came to a company like AP Now and asked for a wire transfer of a million dollars, that would definitely set some wires off, uh, some, some bells off. So, you know, um, it gives them, makes them smarter. Um, the W-2 uh, story, as you probably know, was a scam that spread like wildfire uh, uh, maybe about two years ago, maybe it was three, uh, and this is where crooks pretended to be the CEO and requested that um, the, the person who they were asked, sending the email to, which was mostly payroll managers but some AP managers, send them the W-2 file. Now, if anybody who'd gotten that email and responded to it uh, before they'd gotten it, they'd taken a step back and said, now, wait a second, what does our CEO want with the W-2 file? He can't get far enough away from that information, or she can't. They would have realized it was a fraud, but again, most many of them responded, and the crooks used that to file phony tax refunds, and in some cases, they used it or helped use it for identity fraud. Um, this particular um, little lovely episode has resulted in us now having to uh, file uh, 1099 NECs for the first time this year and that lovely January 31st filing date instead of, um, you know, several months later. So you can thank Crooks. Another, another fallout, if you will, from their um, behavior, misbehavior. Um, the purpose of sharing this slide is not really to go over any numbers, but just to point out, again, that it doesn't matter how small or large you are, you are still going to be targeted. And again, your your goal, your mission, to make sure they're not successful. Finally, um, to make uh, bring home the size point, we've all heard about the Google and Facebook fraud, it was $123 million, and this was uh, where um, somebody was impersonating a vendor, um, and over the course of not very long, because this is Google and Facebook, so big bucks, if you will, um, they were able to get $123 million, some or most of which has been recovered. Um, there's not been that many uh, details ab about that, but okay, you know, you cannot get much bigger than those two. And at the other end of the, the spectrum, 
We have um, a, a Y transfer fraud um, that I actually was associated with. I work as the treasurer. I serve as the treasurer um, for a very small association, a horticultural group. And I got the Y transfer fraud, um, you know, asking me to um, wire them some money. It didn't say how much. And um, I have to tell you, at first, I thought it was a legitimate request. And, um, you know, I, I text. I uh, responded, you know, call me. Of course, the crook did not call me because I would have recognized the voice. And one of the things that they were after was they asked for the bank statements. And again, not 100% sure what they would have done with it, but nothing good. Okay, when they couldn't get anywhere with me because eventually they kept emailing me and I emailed back, look, I know you're a crook. We're not sending you any money. That was the end of that story for a while. But then they found our e-commerce store manager and tried to get him to uh, pay a bill on behalf of the association, as they put it. And they assured him that Mary Schaefer would reimburse him immediately, Okay, just showing that the level of uh, research that they had done, which wasn't a whole lot, it's not hard looking at our website to figure out who the treasurer was. Okay, um, so just sh showing again how innovative and how much research they'll do and that they're not stupid. Okay, so what all this has done is it has become critical that every, that you verify by phone usually um, all sorts of unusual requests. Now, these the first one, which we've been dealing with for a while, are these rush requests supposedly from the CEO or the CFO. Um, and I realized, by the way, this verification has gotten harder once we're in, you know, working remotely, um, especially the way we did so abruptly. Likewise, with the change of bank accounts uh, request, supposedly from a vendor. Now, keep in mind about that. Um, as we worked our way through the COVID crisis, and I realize most of you at this point are still working from home. Um, there have not been as many new bank account openings as there were in the past. So anytime you get a change of bank account request, supposedly from a vendor, on top of all the other stuff, keep this in the back of your mind that um, there are not that many new bank accounts being opened. The gift card purchased uh, purchases, we just we went over that, and a request for any sort of confidential information by an executive, the most common being the W-2. The IRS, by the way, has come out with a directive um, saying that any time any employee receives a request for confidential information of this sort, um, it should be verified by phone um, before the information is sent, because it's been so many of these. So while we're taking advantage um, of technology as much as we can in email, um, so are crooks. Um, and email has become their friend and they've gotten really, really good at playing around with e and the addresses. Typically these crooks, even though they'll be uh, pretending in most cases to be from the United States, unless they're an international vendor, um, they've gotten very good at uh, spoofing email addresses uh, with just, you know, one letter off. Um, they'll buy uh, similar URLs. I have one example here. Um, probably many of you have sat, sat through the, the talks where I go through a lot of this, and so I won't. But just, I mean, if you look Mary Smith at abccompany.com and marysmith at abecompany.com, um, if you were looking that in your emails, that came in. It was not a uh, fraud talk. It's in size 10 or 11 uh, font. Easy, easy to miss. Now, sometimes we overshare and we are our own worst enemy. We, you know, you know, that TMI, too much information. Uh, we need to be careful about what we put out there. I'm not saying don't put anything out there, just the opposite. But for example, um, if you have a LinkedIn in, uh, profile page, which all of you should in, in today's uh, world. This is one of the things that we do as a professional. We have a, a LinkedIn page. Be careful what you put on there. Okay, don't put on there, I do wide transfers for my company. You know, bingo, you just put a bullseye right on your back. You can put, you know, information there without um, making yourself a target for 
um, any crook, but realize that they're looking at LinkedIn, they're looking at uh, Facebook, they're looking at, you know, all sorts of social media sites. So we need to be careful about what we put out there about ourselves and about our company. So I want to give you an extreme example, um, but when you sit down and you think about it, it you know, you can understand what, um, how it works. So I call this one defrauded by a tweet. And what it happened, the way it started out is a uh, company was trying to open up a new bank account and it was having trouble with the bank, its bank. And this was, by the way, before COVID. And it, it, it was not getting satisfactory uh, responses from its bank. And the guy was so aggravated. He got on the, his Twitter account and he put down something like, you know, ABC, the customer service at ABC Bank is terrible. I'm trying to open a, a bank account. I can't get anyone to respond to me. So what he had just done is revealed, you know, where he banked. Um, by looking at his profile, you could see what company he was with. He looked at the company, the crook, looked at the company website, and they were able to piece together um, a, a bit of information about him. And then what they did is they set up a Twitter account, which you can do in like two minutes. Um, uh, and the information they put on the Twitter account made it look like it was the bank, but of course, another one of these situations where it was just off by one or two um, letters. And then they, they, they tweeted back, we are so sorry. Um, uh, and they started the conversation that way. Then they called him on the phone, which of course they got the phone number from the company website, which he didn't realize. And little by little, they were able to extract from him all the information about his existing account. This was over the course of several phone calls trying to resolve his situation. And then they did wire transfers out of his account. So the point being, be careful be a little bit suspicious. Now, next question. And I know I'm going fast, but I have a lot of material I want to go over. Okay, which of the following do you verify before completing? 2A, rush wire request. 2B, change of bank account, email. 2C, both. 2D, either. And 2E, not sure. And let's see. Oh, this is a great audience. Um, I see a lot of two C's. I see some two B's and people are writing in Treasury does wire transfers. Um, somebody said uh, two C because we got caught with a change of bank account issue. Um, so most of you are saying uh, C's, um, Some a few A's, one or two B's but most of you are saying C's. And I have to tell you, I know it's a lot of work, but the answer should be C, unless you're like um, one of uh, our, our members. And she said to me, right when this rush wire transfer stuff started, she said, we got one of them and I knew it was a phony. And I said, how did you know it was a phony? And Vanessa said, because our CFO never talks to me, okay? And that, by the way, you know, we had a good chuckle over it, but that should be, that's one of those clues. If your CFO always sends the wires through the controller and all of a sudden you're getting it directly, just stop and think for a minute, why am I getting it directly? And call. That Something as simple as that uh, can, can save you so to speak. Okay, let's talk about COVID now, some of the stuff that's happened uh, through COVID. Um, I have here a quote from the FBI, um, and he, it says, and you probably could figure this out yourself, history has shown that criminals take every opportunity to perpetrate a fraud on unsuspecting victims, especially when a group is vulnerable. Okay, and then he went on to say individuals and businesses must be vigilant. And believe me, we have all been um, uh, vulnerable, especially in, I would, I would say, March, maybe the beginning of April when we're trying to move our operations home. Specifically, I just want to go over one more time. Avoid opening email attachments or clicking on links if you don't recognize the sender. And I have to tell you, even if I recognize the sender um, and I can find a way to get on that person's website without clicking on the link and find whatever it is they're talking about, I do it. 
confirm that any that any information or funds you're going to send is going to a legitimate recipient. And of course, um, if you've gotten hit with any of these COVID related crimes, you know, selling phony um, vaccine, phony masks, uh, or, you know, you placed an order and you didn't get the goods, uh, make sure you report it. Okay. One of the other things that we've seen an increase in is um, an emails with attachments that are specific to you. So for example, I have I get a number of emails from people we do no business with um, that says, um, please find, attach, please find information about um, the, the payment we just made you or the payment we're going to make you. Okay. And um, I've heard from other people, they get emails that purport to have a purchase order attached to them. So be very careful, even if it looks like um, you know, it's not crazy, a crazy email, but look and see who it is. Is this someone you do business with, somebody you're likely to do business with? I know confirmations are difficult now, are more difficult, but they're not impossible. And remember, your vendors want to be paid. So when you call, there will probably be a way for them to get back to you. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, purchasing, you want to know your suppliers. There have been a number of <clears throat> frauds, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, where uh, people, uh, companies, um, especially in the healthcare industry, placed orders for items that were in really short supply. They sent the money, usually by wire transfer, and they never got the goods. So just be careful. Know your buyer. Um, the FBI also warns that because of all the layoffs and fur furloughs, um, money mules uh, schemes are on the rise again. Um, and this is where crooks are, are going to perpetrate um, usually unauthorized ACH uh, credits or debit fraud. Uh, they've got all the information they need. They just need someplace for that money to go. They can't be uh, traced back to them. And there's been an increase in uh, jobs, uh, receivables agent, things of that nature. Um, and your new uh, employer asks you, can they use your bank account or can you open a new account? and then have the money go through it. And then the money comes in, um, let's say it's $100, you keep $10 and you wire out 90. Anytime anyone asks you anything like that, <clears throat> run. And maybe share that information with the FBI. Okay, um, again, verify, verify, verify. I can't say it enough. Now, one last thing. Uh, a piece of advice I want to go over with you. This actually came from the Met Police in the UK. So you get a call and it, it seems to be from a legitimate, a legitimate vendor. Um, and you're going to call the company back. Call, you know, maybe they're giving you a new bank account, whatever they're doing. Um, you tell them, you'll call them back and you'll call them back using information that you have on hand. Let's say you have their, their phone number on hand. So you hang up the phone, you pick up the phone again, and you call. When you do that, um, and I did not know this, realize that your line, your phone line may be open for a few minutes after you hung up, but before the crook or whoever is on the other end of the phone did. So wait at least five minutes before you make that verification call, or even better, use a different phone line. So if you have two phone lines or three phone lines on your phone, if it came in on, you know, on line one, call out on line two or three. That way they can, you know, hang on to that phone for as long as they want. It won't do them any good. But just be aware of that. Like I say, I, was, I wasn't. Now, one of the things that we saw, this was at the beginning of COVID, um, I guess a lot of companies had business um, drop. So they saw, you know, 50%, for example, um, amount of business drop. And so they had employees who they didn't want to um, lay off, but, you know, didn't have enough work to keep them busy during, the, you know, eight hours for the day. So what they had them doing is going back, looking over old transactions um, to find things that they forgot to bill and then going out and billing them. And we got one of those. And to be honest, when we went and did the research, the vendor hadn't billed us. And so we, it never occurred to us. And so we, it was a legitimate transaction. But many times um, they're not. Those requests are not. Or they are for something that you agreed to write off. Maybe the, the goods were damaged, whatever. So as you get those requests, don't automatically pay them. Um, you have to do your own research. And I know just the perfect time when you have already you're overworked. 
Um, and then, of course, sometimes it's just an unknown vendor and it's an out and out fraud. But this can be from some of your existing vendors. It could be legitimate, but many times it will be for something that you agreed to write off or um, you had no intention of paying or you did pay for. One last thing, and we talked a lot about this last week, um, so I'm not going to go over it um, too much. And it's not exactly fraud, um, but um, your refunds from the airline carriers. There were a few that kind of dragged their feet about giving refunds uh, for flights that were canceled in, you know, March, April, May. Um, so you want to make sure you got all the refunds that you were entitled to. And also, if those refunds went on an employee's personal card, you want to make sure that the employee has remembered to uh, turn it over, turn it back to the company. Okay, so we talked a little bit about LinkedIn and being careful what you post, okay? I'm not saying don't be on it. We all, you were all on it. I'm on it. You need to be on it, but be careful what you post. Um, so, and other social media sites too. A lot of people are on it. Now, most of you by this time, um, hopefully all of you know, you don't post, I'm going on vacation. Um, and, oh, there'll be nobody in my house, so, you know, come and rob me. You wait until you get back and then you can post a few pictures after your back. Um, don't put where you bank, obviously, from that other little story. And be very careful about how you described your position with the organization. You can be uh, vague enough that you don't have to uh, put down you do, you're responsible for doing wire transfers or initiating ACHs or, you know, things like that. You can be, you know, you know, we manage, um, you know, the company's accounts payable team or you find a way to word it without saying that or without giving the idea that you are. Now, some of the information that we put up, it's unavoidable, okay? Um, if your CEO or CFO is going to be a keynote speaker um, at some conference, that, that conference is blasting it all over the place because he, that fact um, is, is a real draw to get people to attend. So, yeah, so now the crooks know that your CEO or CFO is going to be out of the office, more difficult to reach, more difficult for you to get a hold of to verify this rush wire transfer request. Um, you might not want to put on your website that you're making electronic payments and that any vendor who wants to convert to accepting ele electronic payments should fill out the fo a form or you have a form, okay? Because this gives uh, crooks a little extra piece of information um, that they didn't have. Of course, if you're in the rest of the world, other than the U.S., you're making electro everyone's making electronic payments, so uh, you probably don't even address it. And anything else that you might think would help a crook. Okay, so then you have to, if there is a piece of information, you have to weigh what is the business value of putting it out there? Will it help the company attract new business, et cetera, against um, the risk that um, it is. So you're going to see me with this silver bullet several, several times before we finish. Um, you want to educate everyone from the CEO right down to the very lowest level employee that you have. You want to educate them about new frauds and, and how to protect themselves against it. Sometimes just by knowing that the fraud's out there, like the gift card fraud, if you knew that boss impersonation fraud with the boss asking you to get gift cards was going on, then you'd automatically be suspicious when you got that, that email and you'd know something was off, okay? So you want to post online judiciously. When you get an email, um, I want to spend a minute or two talking about how to analyze it. So the first thing that you want to look at is the email address that's used, the email address that it, it's coming from. If it's coming from, um, you know, president at gmail.com, um, or executive president, I think is the one I got, executive president at uh, gmail.com, you want to be suspicious. Um, sometimes, you know, it's not easy to see. You've got to hover over it, um, but you want to see what that email address is. Is it really uh, your CFO? Is it, you know, John Smith at ABC Company? Or is it John Smith at ABE Company? Really easy to miss um, that type of thing versus the... Um, uh, the type of, uh, you know, executive president at Gmail, that's a little bit easier to, to find. Okay, so you want to analyze the email address. The next thing you want to look at 
is the tone of the email. Is this how the person normally writes? Going back to this one that I got as a treasurer uh, for this uh, horticultural group. Um, in it, the person wrote, you know, I can't call you, I'm slammed. Well, if you knew um, Julie, who was president then, she would never say I'm slammed. It's just it, it's words that wouldn't come out of her mouth. Um, she was very genteel. So sometimes the tone of it is, um, we'll, give, we'll give it away. You want to look at the signature. Um, does the person sign the, the, the emails, James Smith, or does he always just sign them Jim? Okay. Um, or does he not sign them? How does he normally or how does she normally sign the emails? And is this the same? And if he normally signs them Jim Smith, a Jim, and all of a sudden it's James Smith, president, ABC company, you can know that something's wrong. Look at the signature block. Is it your signature block? Um, again, going back to the phony email that we got, that I got, they had a beautiful signature block set up. In fact, I thought we should even use it. It was so nicely it had our logo. It was really nicely set up, but you know what? We didn't have one. We didn't use one. So that was another dead giveaway that, hey, this doesn't. And then my, you know, the million dollar question, does this make sense? What would our CEO want the W-2s for? What in God's name? Um, in most organizations, she can't get far enough away from the W-2s, okay? I think, okay, so you, you want to look some more um, ways that we're going to analyze the email address. If it's from a Gmail, a Hotmail, or anything like that, okay, you know that uh, something's off. Okay. Tone. Does it sound okay? How does the how does your CEO, whoever it is, normally write? Um, even if you get the email that's supposedly from your boss and it says, "Hi, are you busy? Can you help me?" Does your boss normally say, "Can you help me?" Or does he say, "Do this," or or you know, run over and do that? Is, is he normally that polite, or is he more polite, um, or she? Okay, so just look, look at the tone. And again, the signature. Some people sign any, uh, their emails, uh, some people don't. Some people use their full formal name, some don't. Some use their, their nickname. Some will have a signature put on that's used uh, some sort of uh, different font so that it looks like it's signed, but it's not, and others don't. So again, just how does it look compared to um, how they normally sign their emails? Again, the signature block. Um, it was a beautiful one they set up for us, but not one we ever used. And again, does this make sense? Why would they want this? I call this the 30 second test or the smell test. Um, is this something that would normally be asked for? Um, does, it make, does it make sense? And going back to uh, my example where they were asking me to send the bank statements, again, um, the president, the woman who was president of the organization at that time, she couldn't get far enough away from the financial information. So wanting to look at a bank statement was a dead clue that um, something wasn't right in Denmark. Okay, now this piece of information, this piece of advice came from the FBI. I've been talking about it for a number of years. I still can't remember to do it. And that is when you reply to any email, instead of hitting the reply key, hit the forward key and then type the email address in of the person. So if you got this phony email from the CFO, and you hit return and now you type in the correct email address for your CFO, even though you didn't recognize that it was a fraudulent email, um, when the CFO gets it, he or she is going to be saying, you know, what is this? Where did this come from? And you're not going to have given information to um, a crook that you shouldn't have. Now, I was having dinner one night with my sister and we were talk I was brought this up and I was talking about it. And I said, you know, I went all day. I couldn't remember to use the forward key instead of the, re the reply key. And she said, I mean, that's ridiculous. You re how can you not remember to use the forward key? I said, okay, and we moved on. Next day at five o'clock, I got an email from her and she said, I have to apologize. I was so sure that I was going to be able to use the forward key all day in responding to emails 
And she said, in reality, I couldn't remember to use it once. So this is the best practice advice. Um, I share it whenever I give a talk. And I always tell people, if you can remember to do this, can you drop me a line and tell me? Um, so I can say that finally, there has been one person who has been able to take advantage of this piece of advice. And I'm still waiting for that, for that, um, met that note. So if you can remember, um, do this. Also, if you're looking at an email, and you're analyzing it and you're thinking, mm, I think it's him, I don't know. Try responding using the forward key, okay? So that's, remember. So again, I'm gonna repeat, educate everyone, and we have to be smarter about recognizing manipulated email addresses. Crooks are getting really smart about it. There are a number of little tricks that they can do. So for example, um, they'll buy a URL that is very close to your URL. And let's say you have an M in your address, in your email address, there's an M in the way you spell your company's name, M like Mary. What they'll do is they'll buy the same URL, but instead of an M, they'll buy, they'll put an R and an N. And if you look at an, a small R and a small N next to each other, um, especially if you're reading fast, it's going to look like an N and you're not going to be able to recognize it. There are a few other tricks like that, um, that they know, you know, like a, a C and an L, small C, small L might look like a small D. Um, so be, spend a, a little bit of time looking. Now, I've been spending a lot of time here talking about email addresses, okay? But keep in mind that the email that email may be a letter, maybe a letter that comes in the mail, or it can be a text. So the letter probably would be more from a vendor looking for a change of bank account. And I have heard not a lot, but several stories where it came in a letter. And of course, the reason it doesn't come in a letter is that's more work and takes more time and costs money. Uh, but occasionally it will be, and um, it can also be a text. So let me share with you, because. Um, you know, I, I like to laugh every once in a while if, if, if I can, if there's something funny. And I call this the funny texting story. So um, I was at a meeting, somebody shared this with me. And she said she was sitting in her boss's office and they were talking about whatever they were talking about. And her cell phone buzzed in the pocket, in her pocket. So she took it out and there was a message, a text message, supposedly from her boss, who she was talking to, asking her to go out and buy some gift cards. I said, hey, um, are you busy? What are you doing? Do you have some time? Uh, can you go out and get some gift cards? So, of course, she knew they, that it was a, a phony. They both had a good laugh. But really, um, most of us would not be that lucky. Some other signs some are um, a sense of urgency. You know, all of a sudden, this has to be done immediately. Uh, rush. Uh, can't wait. Um, the next issue is sometimes they'll have a, 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 an air of secrecy about it. In, in one of the early frauds, it said, don't talk to anyone about this. And as a matter of fact, which should have been a red flag, by the way, don't, um, if you see me in the hall, don't talk to me about this. Only email according to, I forget whether it said SEC guidelines or GAP guidelines, but something that was totally ridiculous, okay? But that should have, you know, why not? Why, if you're asking me to do a rush wire transfer, why shouldn't I, why can't I tell my boss? I mean, is this a surprise bonus for him or for her? I don't think so. Um, so that also should be a, um, a, set, uh, a note or, or set off, set off uh, uh, a red flag saying, hey, what's going on here? Maybe something's not kosher. Um, and then is this how it normally happens? Do you normally get a uh, wire transfer request directly from this person or does it usually come from the controller or your manager or somebody in treasury or how does it normally come? If it's anything out of the ordinary, then you want to be suspicious and you want to take a second look um, closely. Um, one of the things that I like to say um, is I'm always very suspicious and verify, and what if you can't verify? Um, my response is that I would, my reaction would be not to make the change because I would much rather go up and apologize to the CFO for not making the transaction, you know, sending the money 
um, that that this that was requested on time because I was investigating whether it was a, a phony request. I'd rather do that as unpleasant and as that might be than be up trying to explain why I had sent $2 million uh, to someone that we were never going to get back because it was a fraudulent request and how I, oh, I looked at that email and I thought it came from you. It looked like it came from you because nobody's going to take your side in that battle. Um, so just, you know, be a little cautious. Um, fraud prevention, it's um, a team sport, so we have to get everybody involved, and it's an ongoing battle. So don't forget that piece of advice that came from one of our readers, where she said, anytime we hear of a new uh, fraud, we make a copy of, whether it's an article or something from me, or where, whatever it is, and share it with everybody. And make sure your staff understands that it's high priority, though that you consider it high priority, that they look at that stuff um, pretty quickly. Um, this is a game of cat and mouse. Um, you know, they do, the crooks do one thing, the business community reacts and comes up with a, a prevention or a detection uh, methodology that prevents this fraud, and then they come up with something new, and then the business community reacts, and then they come up with something else new. Okay, and they don't seem, there seems to be an endless supply of ideas for them, as annoying as that is. Okay, as we come down towards the end of our time together, let's have a wrap up of some best practices. Again, um, yeah, I know I'm saying it again, uh, and I'm like a broken bullet, but I'm a broken bullet, a broken record on this because it is the single best way that you can protect your organization against fraud. I'm not saying if you do this, you'll have no fraud, but it'll make a serious dent in the number of the amount. Okay, and that is education. As soon as you find out something, share it with everyone um, across the board, you know, right up and down the career ladder, if you will. Um, let you be the broken record trying to protect your organization. Um, and the next thing is be suspicious, okay? Um, anytime like you, you get a request and your, your instinct is to um, maybe, um, you know, be pleased, oh, look what they asked me to do, or maybe they're thinking of promoting me, or they trust me, whatever it is. Um, yeah, that's a nice thought, but be suspicious also. And think about uh, why would they be doing it this way? Does it make sense? Um, why isn't this coming through my bo through my boss, etc. Whatever you can think of, and then look at the email address if it came by email. Okay, and by the way, um, if you get it by phone and you think you recognize the phone voice, be aware it's only happened in the UK to the best of my knowledge at this point, but it could just as easily um, happen here. Is there have been instances where they used uh, voice technology on the phone? and um, they altered the voice of the person speaking so it sounded like the person's voice. So anything that's odd, out of the ordinary, be suspicious. Um, if someone asks you who normally doesn't ask you, be suspicious. Um, anytime it's a rush, be suspicious. Be suspicious. It's better to be asked and told yes than the opposite, okay? Don't be afraid to ask for verification. Don't be afraid to ask why, um, you know, and, and hopefully you work for an organization that is um, up on these things, uh, your management team is, and that this has happened enough times to enough different organizations, got enough publicity so that when you're there asking why, um, they um, understand why, they understand why you're asking for the verification and nobody's jumping down your throat. Um, and it's not just do what I told you to do, um, that they understand. And in fact, um, that even thank you. Um, so be, don't be afraid to ask. Um, you may be surprised that not only will they say, yes, I did ask for you to do this, but thank you for asking. Or even better, no, we didn't ask that. I don't know where that came from. And thank you for catching it. Keep that in mind. So verification is critical. It's become really critical in the last few months, um, few years. It depends upon, you know, however long. Um, you want to verify anything out of the ordinary because um, there will be new frauds. And again, I can't tell you what they are. I wish I could tell you what they are. The only thing that I can tell you is that if you hear of one and you share it with me, I will share it with our community because that we, that's, again, 
uh, fraud protection is a team sport, and that's how we help protect all of ourselves. Your goal um, is to recognize uh, potential frauds, investigate them, and hopefully save your organization before you fall for them, okay? Because afterwards, um, you know, trying to get that money back is sometimes impossible. So these questions for you to ask, does this make sense? Does this request make sense? Um, you know, why would the CEO want the W-2s? Uh, why is this wire transfer coming directly to me? What are we doing with gift cards? Okay, something like that, or something else, because I don't know what it's going to be. And then the next thing to ask is, okay, why would they want this? Um, and you don't always know the answer to that, okay? I mean, you certainly can't ask the CEO when they're asking you for financial information to say, turn around and say, well, what do you want to do with this? Okay, really not a good career move, but you can say, say you know, you're trying to verify that they did make the request. And um, if you're still a little hesitant to ask that question, just take a moment and stop and say, is there an easier way to get this information? So for example, with that W-2 fraud, uh, most organizations, instead of giving the CEO every single W-2 form, you know, in a PDF um, attachment, it probably would have been easier just to dump that information into an Excel spreadsheet and give them the Excel spreadsheet if they really wanted it, okay? Um, again, think about the tone. Um, does it sound like him or her? Is this something that she would want? Going back to my um, association, what a cultural group, um, is that, you know, would Julie ever look at numbers? No, she wouldn't. So, you know, that's another dead, dead uh, sign, a sign that something's off. And is there anything else funny about this email? Anything else odd that you think is out of place? So be suspicious. Um, continually look at, for new frauds, expect new frauds, and realize that sometimes this may mean we have to change our best practices, change our processes and procedures. And yes, they always, all these changes always mean more work. They never, you know, they never make things easier. But, you know, your company can't afford to be spending millions of, sending millions of dollars to people that don't are not entitled to it. They'll go out of business. So just um, as this, we're just about at the end, some um, key players in fraud protection, you know, have good passwords, change them periodically, educate, you know, everyone. Um, make sure when IT comes down and they want to check your security protocols or they want to update them, let them. Don't, you know, tell them, go away, I'm too busy. I know how tempting that is. You want to make sure you use your best practices um, that incorporate strong internal controls and, of course, the very basics of uh, having appropriate separation of duties. Okay, our bottom line, fraud is going to continue. It's not going away. They're successful too often. They're making money doing it, okay? And um, if, they, if they weren't, they would go away. So the question really is, um, are you going to let them drive the fraud bus or are you going to stand and drive the fraud prevention bus and make sure that they are not successful? And in fact, that they're so unsuccessful, they go someplace else. They just leave your company alone. Um, the choice is up to you. And we've got our last uh, question for the audience. And I'm really actually curious to see what your answers are. So what is your biggest concern regarding fraud for the rest of 2020? Uh, 3A, we inadvertently lose con loosened control, that should say loosened, loosened controls during COVID and made an unauthorized transaction. Uh, 3B, some of our verification processes are not being followed. 3C, we're not doing a good as job as we should when it comes to educating everyone on new frauds. 3D, all of the above. And if you have something else um, and you write it in, that would be great also. A lot of Ds, um, I would say followed by Cs, followed by A, and one or two Bs. Um, and somebody said um, uh, B due to sta short staff situation. Um, yeah, I know. It's 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 yeah. It's a it's a rough time. Okay, so you're all, um, you know, on track, um, and thank you for your, for your input.
Um, we've just about run out of time now. Um, so if you had, have any questions or you think about this afterwards and you have questions that you want to ask, uh, feel free to drop me a line. Um, I'm always happy to answer. And by the way, I'm always happy to um, uh, listen to what you have to say and, of course, news stories. That's, that, that's where, that's how um, I get all this great information. That wraps up our event for today. I'd like to take a moment to remind you to fill out the evaluation that will be emailed to you in about one hour. If you would like a certificate of attendance for CPE continuing education purposes or any other purpose for that matter, that should be requested on that form within one week. We'll be back on August 26th with a session on B notices and backup withholding. It's that time of the year again. And then on September 10th, we're going to be talking about internal controls. We hope to uh, see you again at one of these events. Thank you for attending today. This program is now concluded. And be safe, everyone. <laughs>